the um, I want to call to order this um, May 4th, uh, 2020 uh, special meeting of the Arcata City Council. And this is the budget study session. So I will turn it over to the city manager, Karen Deemer and uh, Andrea Sarshevsky, our uh, finance manager. Okay, great. Thank you, Mayor, and um, welcome, everyone. So we are operating, of course, as a teleconference meeting again on Zoom. Uh, so we do have our email open right now. We will take public comment towards the end of this meeting. We have not yet received any public comment for the budget items tonight. But if you uh, want your comments to be read by staff as part of this recorded meeting, please email them now at PC at cityofarcata.org. That's pc at cityofarcata.org. Uh, and those comments can still be read into the record tonight. Uh, so with that, let's start with the roll call. Mayor Winkler? Uh, here. Vice Mayor Patino? Here. Council Member Watson? Here. Council Member Pereira? Here. OK, all present. Um, so just to open tonight, uh, what we the way that we have our budget structured this year uh, is sort of rapidly evolving uh, with the financial impacts that we are continuing to assess with the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, so we have a draft budget available. We have been able to basically balance every activity with the exception of the general fund. Uh, we, you will see our finance director will go through in pretty great detail the assumptions that we've made to the budget, uh, as well as some of the high level cuts that we've made at this point to that budget. Uh, we have a few data points that are still being revised. Uh, the most significant is probably the governor's May revise for the state budget and how some of our state funding allocations will affect our budget. Uh, in addition, we do still have some projections around the sales tax uh, deferral programs that the finance director will go into more detail about in her presentation. Uh, as well as some of our local programs as we're finalizing what we will be opening and won't be able to open for summer recreation, uh, sports fields, and programs as we move through sort of this next week. So our recommendation as a staff uh, at this point is to receive sort of the overall big picture tonight. Uh, if, I assume there will be many questions, if we have time, our suggestion will be to go through some of the enterprise funds, our water fund, the sewer fund, and perhaps the community development department funds, which are a little bit of mixed general fund, but a lot of other revenue sources, if we want to go into detail on those. Um, give you some time to look through the budget. We need probably another week or two, really, to try to do some refinement. Um, you will find that our general fund is still in a deficit mode, so we have some work to do there. Uh, but at this point, we just wanted the council to see sort of how severe our cuts are to get to this level. And, and then we will need a little bit of extra time. You know, we don't need to have a past budget until the end of June, given the fluidity of some of the information coming in around COVID-19 and the loss in revenue to the city, uh, things really are changing. So I think we've got good projections to start with tonight, and then we'll just go through and, and take questions. So with that, I was gonna turn it over to Director Starhevsky uh, for the overview. She'll be sharing her screen, I believe, we really just have, I think, five or six uh, slides. Uh, with So we'll stop after each slide and see if the council has questions on that information. Thank you. Anything to start with? That sounds all right. All right. Director Starhevsky? OK, good evening, council. Thank you for your time tonight. I'm happy to present a, a budget overview for our fiscal year 2020-21 uh, budget for the city of Arcata. So tonight we'll be covering a couple different topics that will include our budget principles. Uh, next topic will involve our assumptions and revenue reductions included in our proposed budget plan. That also touches upon our sales tax deferral, deferral program um, that's been enacted by our governor and how that affects our budget projections. And then also getting into our budget expense reductions and there will be a summary of a couple of quick points as well at the end of the presentation. So our budget principles related to our citywide budget projection process 
includes recommended budget uh, that will include balanced budget where our current expenditures and our revenues will balance. Our revenues will also be estimated at realistic levels and you'll see those assumptions factored in later as part of the presentation related to the shelter in place order. We will continue to maintain essential services and those will be funded. Our reserve balances will be maintained at levels sufficient to protect us from any unforeseen emergencies. Are there any questions at this time? Andrea, um, yes. you, say, you say that the reserve balance will be maintained at levels sufficient. What, what does that mean? What, what percentage does that mean? Yes, uh, so that would be 25% of our operating expenses would be what we consider a level high enough to uh, keep the city afloat if unforeseen circumstances should happen, where we have some operating expenses we put away every single year to maintain that 25%. We also have a, a small emergency fund as well for the general fund. Great, thank you. You're welcome. And what's the time period? How long when we uh, predict how much money to put away? How much time is that supposed to cover? So I don't have that analysis complete for tonight. However, I will be doing deeper analysis uh, as some of these assumptions are changing related to the shelter in place order. And I can present those to council as part of our next meeting. Uh, I wanna have some really good solidified fund balance projections across the board for general fund and for our enterprise funds and a little bit of cash flow analysis as well to present to you where we think we'll be at the end of this fiscal year at 6.30 based off the shelter in place order, and then where we'll be at the end of fiscal year 2021 based off of that. Uh, and then on average, I wanna be able to present to you how much those cash flows will uh, tide us over uh, if the shelter in place order continues you know, longer than we're projecting, uh, how much payroll that will cover and how, many, uh, how much uh, of our general day-to-day -day expense that will cover as well. So that is something I will get into greater detail at one of our later budget sessions. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? No, okay, thank you. So there are several assumptions that we're including in our fiscal year 2021 uh, revenue uh, reductions or revenue projections related to the shelter in place order in COVID-19. Uh, for the, the largest impacts we are seeing are related to general fund, but there's a couple other funds as well that are affected at this point in time. So some of those projections involve our sales tax for general fund and our transaction and use tax. And just wanted to point out our sales tax is our number one single source of revenues for our general fund. Uh, and we're looking at a, a loss of about 300, uh, sorry, a loss of about 773,000. That is using an assumption of about 30% decrease uh, in the next fiscal year. For our transaction and use tax, we're looking at a loss of about 590,000 uh, for the next fiscal year. So overall, the decrease with those, those two taxes together is about 1.3 million uh, that would impact general fund. And there are some other assumptions related to how we came up with the sales tax and transaction use tax losses. Uh, some of that is related to the fact that our small businesses are able to defer when they pay the taxing agency uh, for our state and then when that money is received in the city of Arcata. So one example of the assumption that relates to those tax revenues is that we believe 100% of our businesses are eligible for sales tax referrals and to be able to set up one-year payment plans of, of all of our businesses are eligible for uh, the ability to set up payment plans that they will actually take and exercise that option. Uh, so that means that they can defer their sales tax payments uh, for Q1 and Q2 of this year and that will get delayed and deferred over 12 month payment plan. And we may not receive the full amount of those sales tax revenues until June of 2021. And I'll get a little bit into a little bit more detail about what those deferral programs look like. Uh, we also have transient occupancy tax. We're looking at a, about $200,000 decrease in revenue. And that is just related to our assumption that the shelter in place order 
uh, could be lifted as early as June 30th, but there'll be some residual tax revenue loss if full occupancy cannot be maintained in our local hotels. Um, so that, like I said, that was a $200,000 uh, reduction to budget. We also have some property tax reductions and utility user tax reduction. Overall, just looking at where we're at climate-wise, 5% is a safe assumption to use for property tax reductions. Uh, we are seeing some declines at county level uh, due to pushing off the time that they're getting their receivables and they're at about 4% year over year. Our utility users tax is a factor of a discontinuation uh, or lack of discontinuation during the shelter and order uh, where PG&E isn't doing shutoffs for gas and electric and uh, we're not doing, we're not enforcing water discontinuations or um, as well. So there could be about a 10% reduction on those tax revenues. Uh, during this time as well, we could see a loss related to parking fines, and that would be just in our first quarter of next year. Uh, business, license business license revenue as well, we could see some decreases uh, just due to uh, the fact that our renewal time period is uh, May and June, we typically receive revenues for the next fiscal year, and if there's some businesses that are not able to operate during that time period, there could be some loss in revenue. And our major assumption for uh, our budget projections are that the shelter in place will be lifted by June 30th. Uh, and we also have a couple scenarios that we've run as well to see the impact if the shelter in place order is lifted in the end of August and that the end of December, beginning of January. Uh, one of the assumptions baked in as well is related to our rental income loss, um, where we're seeing a loss of about 73,000 if there are no large gatherings allowed for people uh, over the count of 100 people. So if there are restrictions that are still in place, we could see rental income loss, uh, for example, our ballpark or our ball field rental. Uh, we are, as our city manager pointed out at the beginning of the presentation as well, we're waiting on some revisions from the governor uh, to be able to accurately project for our roads and SB1 funding allocations. And a couple other assumptions in our budget relate to our water rate increase that has been delayed until September 1st of this year and our wastewater rate increase, which has been delayed until January 1st of next year. Are there any questions? So I guess I'm curious, the assumptions that have been made to put this together for us. Uh, for example, the general fund, uh, assuming to decrease by 12 percent it's just I'm just wondering what what went into that it just seems like that they're not nearly as conservative um, yeah this, this seems like way too way too generous and hopeful I guess uh, yeah. yes so as of right now we are using a couple of assumptions that we have walked through uh, with our third party sales tax consultants just to get a feel for some of the overall percentages that they're projecting out for industry loss however i completely understand where you're coming from where we're using a july 1st open date and we can analyze what that looks like if we think the shelter in place order will last a little bit later into the year. So there are a couple scenarios we have run uh, to see how general fund is impacted as of August 31st and then as of December 31st. And then that also looks at impact within the shelter recovery phase, uh, or sorry, shelter in place phase within a, a small recovery phase and with a little bit longer term uh, so over an 18 month period, analyzing what the overall impacts would be if we have a good understanding of what the shelter in place order will be. So, or the timing of the shelter in place order. So right now we are going with the July 1st assumption, but we can always come back to council if we want to run other assumptions as well and present that to you to show what that overall impact would be. Uh, for further shelter in place uh, time periods as well. So that's something we can definitely put together and, and present. I feel like uh, there's a lot of similarities between this problem we're, we're going to face and uh, for example, sea level rise and how that's looked at. And you know, you know, there's a, you know, there's a problem that's coming. We don't know how severe it's gonna be. And in that case uh, of sea level rise, there's multiple models. And even within each model, they provide a range, the best case scenario, worst case scenario. 
Uh, so I guess this, yeah, just kind of like take one stab at it and here's our one prediction across the board. Um, it, it doesn't feel like there's enough information here to create a budget, uh, okay. so, and, you know, especially since there's nothing like this ever that's ever happened. Exactly. Um, so I completely understand that this is an unprecedented situation. We can run a couple different scenarios and present those to council just to show what each of those looks like. A best case scenario, a mid range and a worst case scenario as part of budget uh, sessions and budget adoption process. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Well, my understanding is that the the um, this budget is based on on a um, July first lifting. Or let's see, we're at um, May now. July first lifting of the shelter in place is what uh, the budget is based on. Yes, that is correct. Mm -hmm. That um, my preference would be if we regard the um, the later date is a as a uh, sort of mid-range assumption, then I think basing the budget on a more conservative assumption would be something that I would be more comfortable with. I, I don't know what how the other council members feel about that. Michael, what date are you talking about exactly? All right. So um, um, Andrea, you had you had three dates that one was was um, July 1st, the second one was was it September 1st or September 30th? It's September oh, here 1st. Yeah, yes. September 1st, and the other one was was uh, December was December 31. So I would be more comfortable with the with the uh, 831 date, uh, September 1st date, and then we can reassess. Let's say in uh, two or three months to see whether that is still a realistic date, or whether we need to make it even a more conservative assumption than that. Because I I think that at this point since we have not lifted the shelter in place and we, we haven't had a direction from the governor to, that uh, he's going to lift the shelter in place that I, I think that the um the first date would would be uh much too optimistic for for my comfort at this point thank you i can definitely run those assumptions but that but i would want to get a uh a, direction from the council i mean that's just my individual feeling okay. on on whether they they would like to um, make a change from from that date as, as the uh, baseline assumption for this budget well, i'll just offer that as we went through i mean and you'll see sort of the dramatic effect of the cuts that were required to make to even look at a july 1st opening uh, that we do have and we're happy to share with the council that contingency planning for a september 1st or a january 1st opening um, to make the cuts right now to comply with the september 1st uh, opening um, is pretty dramatic um, pretty daunting to even recover from in any kind of time frame so the intent was to put out something that we thought really was um, realistic uh, but at the same time was sort of not the, the end of the world scenario. Uh, and then to be managing that monthly for the council if we needed to come back and make deeper cuts. So at this point, even under this scenario, we're not at balance and we will bring back options to be in a balanced budget. Uh, and then we can do so uh, for some of those later dates. But uh, as we work through sort of the recommendations tonight, I think you'll see why we ultimately went with sort of this first phase scenario, which um, does tend to be the one that most cities are looking at in terms of um, initial set of assumptions to build a budget around. Uh, and not to say that that is gonna be the end all, but the governor has indicated starting to reopen in some of the rural areas, even as soon as the end of this week on some retail, again, for pickup, not for in-store shopping. But we're hoping that within the next four to six weeks, we'll start to see some opening up. Uh, we're certainly seeing those indications from the governor. But Andrea, do you want to continue? Sure. So I touched upon on the previous slide, just some of the impacts for the sales tax deferral programs that have been in, 
put in place by our governor uh, as a um, measure, uh, a measure to help alleviate uh, some of our small businesses in the state of California. So one of those programs is a 90 day sales tax deferral program. So for example, all of our taxes that were due for this for first quarter, the end of March, we would typically receive, um, the, the taxing agency would typically receive at the end of April. And then the city of Arcata typically will receive disbursements uh, for a three month period. And then there's a catch up, but those first two months are advances. And uh, that is based off of sales tax revenues we've, we have received uh, in the prior year. And then that third period at the end of a quarter, they do a little bit of catch up to see what we've received so far and then what is still owed to us based off of the receipts they are uh, bringing in. So we believe that uh, this will just delay some of our revenues from a sales tax perspective, but we have to carefully monitor cash flows uh, because this will push uh, a majority of our, our revenues into a different period than we were expecting to receive them. Uh, we believe that for the city of Arcata, about 347 businesses currently qualified to defer their sales taxes, and that would equate to about $437,000 in delayed revenues. Uh, and that is available to um, all businesses. There's no threshold, I believe, for what their revenues are. However, there's another relief program that does have a threshold uh, for businesses who uh, do not bring in, who bring in less than $5 million a year. Uh, and that equates to about $50,000 in sales tax liability. They will have the option to defer their first quarter, which typically would be due in April to the taxing agency and their second quarter sales tax payment, which would typically be due at the end of July uh, to our, our state taxing agency. And they can spread that pay those two payments over 12 month time period. So we could have delayed revenues going all the way into the next uh, beginning of the next fiscal year. Uh, so once again, more delayed revenues, and this could impact 326 businesses in Arcata, about $270,000 in delayed revenues. Just wanted to highlight uh, the program that's been put in place so far and the estimate that we believe the businesses will take the opportunity to delay um, if possible. Are there any questions for me? Okay, moving to the next slide. So we have several different, oh, is there a question? Okay, we have several different expense assumptions baked into the budget currently. And a lot of those assumptions relate to personnel costs. For instance, we have uh, a couple of items that are related to our employee benefits programs, uh, such as healthcare premiums, where we're expecting increases of uh, about $88,000 in the next year. We also have CalPERS unfunded liability, which is expected to increase by about $200,000 in the next fiscal year. Uh, we also have uh, included our 27th payroll cycle as one of our budget assumptions for expense projections. We also have included workers' comp insurance expenses, uh, which is a small increase for next year. And then overall, the total increases baked into the budget for uh, personnel cost assumptions uh, equates to about $654,000 for the next year. Uh, this includes our overtime and our part-time salaries. Uh, and we also have some other miscellaneous expenses we're expecting increases in, which include our liability property and auto insurance that'll increase about 175,000 in the next year. Um, just wanted to give you a high level overview of some major expenses that the city is gonna be incurring in the next fiscal year as part of our budget projections. Are there any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Andrea, the uh, yes. uh, liability property auto insurance expenses going up by 42%, is there some reason for that? I do not know the answer to that. Um, I believe our uh, assistant city manager is on the call as well uh, and has been in uh, meetings with REMIF uh, as far as to the assumptions as to why our insurance is increasing. Um, but I don't have a direct uh, rationale for the auto liability and property increase for the next year. 
Yeah, it just seems really large for Yes, uh, no, I I agree. Do you want me to go ahead and address that, Paul? This Thank you. Yeah, um, so the uh, bulk of it is we have been seeing some steady increases over the last couple of years. The um, climate is very volatile. We're seeing a lot of claims with just the natural disasters that have been happening with the flooding and the fires. Um, so that is um, that is affecting our rates as far as getting our excess carrier insurance. And then we're also seeing some higher jury verdicts that are happening a lot with um, police vehicle accidents throughout, um, throughout our membership. Um, as an example, so some of those, some of the general liability cases that have been uh, litigated have been starting to, to cost a, a bit more than what we've seen in the past. So those are probably some of the bigger, um, the, the bigger, it's even though we're, we do some self-insurance, it's our excess carrier that is still um, uh, looking at the overall state and nation as far as claims experience and potential liabilities. And so we do encounter a lot of that um, with the excess coverage that we have to purchase beyond the REMIF layer of coverage. And when I say we, I mean as a REMIF member, so the whole right. REMIF. Thanks, Danette. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Okay. Oops. Apologies. So there are some uh, budget reductions that we have included as part of the proposed budget. And this affects different expenses citywide. So there are several positions identified that are currently vacant or anticipated to be vacant that we have included, or uh, sorry, we have uh, excluded from an expense perspective for proposed budget. We have also uh, frozen all new vehicle purchases and that saves us citywide about 1.3 million. We have eliminated uh, training and travel with the exception of state required licensing and any reimbursable related training and travel as well. For example, if it's related to a grant program or other agencies, we're still including that as part of the budget assumptions for the next year. We also are deferring all capital projects that require general fund allocation, and we're reducing a majority of part-time personnel. And uh, just to kind of backtrack on a couple of uh, inputs there, uh, for the six anticipated or currently anticipated vacant positions, uh, that saves the city about $295,000. Um, as I had brought up, the all new vehicle or the free, freezing all new vehicle purchases saves us about $1.3 million citywide. The training and travel saves about 35,000 and the part-time reductions uh, saves us about uh, 38,000 uh, decrease over last year's expenses. Uh, and that reflects about 168,000 decrease in the presented budget. Um, so overall just reductions trying to balance everything out and still maintain essential services. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. And then just a really high level summary. Oh, Mayor, is there a question? Uh, no, I'm just uh, leaning into uh, okay. to look more closely at, at the numbers in the proposed thank budget. You. Thank you. So this is just a really high level summary fund by fund for what our revenues and our expenditures are, our appropriations uh, for this year as proposed versus last year. And uh, as our city manager uh, called attention to, we are currently at a $770,000 deficit in our general fund. So our expenses are exceeding our revenues currently. Uh, and that actually is shown here that $1.8 million uh, decrease year over year in the general fund is 99% uh, of that is related to projected tax loss uh, in the general fund. 
And then our overall citywide personal expenses are increasing by 654,000. Uh, those are just some major budget assumptions I wanted to uh, wrap the presentation up with. And then as you have in your packets within the memo, uh, the summary of the revenues and appropriations for next year as they are in draft form right now. Um, are there any additional questions for me? Could you uh, go over uh, line 662 and, and just uh, summarize what, what goes in, into the uh, sure. in, increase from uh, 7 million to 22 million? Sure, so that is actually factoring, factoring in phase one of the wastewater treatment plan. So we have an increase on both the revenue side and on the expense or the appropriation side that wouldn't have been factored in in prior year. Um, and you'll, uh, that's uh, included in our capital improvements line. Uh, so there's expenditures for the wastewater treatment plant upgrade. And then on the other side, there is some financing and some grant funding we're expecting uh, to have fund uh, our phase one of our treatment plant. Thank you. You're welcome. Did you say, maybe it was on the last slide, what percentage of the staff uh... We estimate we're gonna to have to lay off. So uh, we are not uh, looking at total furloughs or layoffs at this point in time. Uh, we have asked uh, departments if there's any part-time staff that they could reduce, and that is what's reflected currently in the uh, summary in the last section for the part-time reduction of the 168,000, where we've been able to identify some cost savings for part-time personnel. Uh, and the other section just identifies currently vacant, vacant positions that we just will not fill going into the next fiscal year. Uh, but we have not had uh, a deep look into furloughs or layoffs at this point in time. Uh, we are trying to get to that uh, balance for general fund deficit right now uh, and going back with department heads and looking at cost savings or potential revenue increases across the board uh, to try to get balance. Um, so I don't know if the city manager has any any additional comments uh, to add to that, but that's where we are at this point in time. And just to clarify where it says reduces majority of part-time personnel, that means eliminate or fire, or terminate or layoff, yeah. correct? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I guess it just seems a little, I don't know, it's not very even-handed uh, that basically only the people on the bottom of the tier are are getting impacted, but no one else anywhere above them um has taken a hit that's, that's my comments so included in the budget does reduce a majority of our part-time personnel that is reflected in the general fund um, part of our uh, mous also do require us to look at part-time uh, before we look at citywide layoffs uh, the budget also includes the freezing or basically you know the the layoff of six positions uh, they Fortunately, we're spread pretty evenly between general funded departments uh, that we either have current vacancies or we have one that we have a vacancy which will come up in about two to three weeks. Uh, so we have those six positions that in essence, you know, would have been laid off uh, if we weren't have the ability to freeze those at this time. But as our finance director indicated, uh, the point that we've been able to get the budget to at this stage with the data that we have still has a general fund deficit of you know seven hundred and seventy thousand dollars so uh, we've got some refinement to do still in our revenue side but then we're going to have to be looking at hard uh potential reductions as well which you know nothing is off the board yet in terms of that but this so i guess that's where I'm, I'm a little bit confused as i feel like we've acknowledged for a long time that there, were, there are going to have to be reductions there's going to be a re reduction in revenue um, and we're talking about it right now, it's definitely going to happen, but we're not doing anything right now. And I understand it's a different fiscal year, but uh, it just seems like, I don't know, I feel like we're not really taking the severity of the financial impacts. I don't feel like it's, you know, like I'm worst case scenario and stuff. I think it kind of leans that way. Um, so yeah, that's just my sense right now is that uh, this isn't conservative enough. Um, we don't have enough information the there wasn't enough information that went into uh these estimates and we should be making significant cuts yesterday 
with with that in mind, one thing I would be interested in would be if we could get a summary of reductions that were taken in the uh, 2008 uh, recession. What were some steps that were taken at that time, and uh, how that was worked out with the uh, represented employees as a as a point of reference, and uh, what the reductions in revenues that happened at that time, uh, percentage wise. And so we have some historical information as a point of comparison for what's happening right now, to some limited degree. How about uh, early retirement or, uh, you know, what do you want to say, golden handshake, but uh, not really golden handshake, just uh, early retirement? Uh, is there any of that? Um, I've heard of, of some being considered at a statewide level. Uh, the CSU and the UC system are both looking at potential programs. Um, I have seen some cities in the California that are considering what's called the golden handshake from PERS. It's two years of PERS service credit. Uh, we haven't done refined assumptions um, through PERS. You know, some initial calculations show some real short-term savings, but really no long-term savings to the city in terms of the PERS golden handshake program. So Arcata has always steered away from that. Uh, if the council would want us to look at incentivizing retirements through some monetary measure, my recommendation would be to do something that's immediate, that's paid out either immediately or over two years so that we cap whatever that, you know, that expense is going to be uh, versus something like a PERS golden handshake that you're in essence getting a savings at first two years, but you're paying out then over another 10 to 15 years to make up that cost. Uh, yeah, I, I'd be interested in what you uh, on what you suggested. Not not the PERS golden handshake, but looking at our our employees and saying, okay, what what can we do? What would make sense? And how many people could we encourage to take that? A uh, pause part of that. I would also like to see a financial analysis of what savings could be achieved in the short run and what increased expenses would result in, in the long run so that we could have uh, some picture financially of what, what the impact would be of, of uh, such a program. Okay, are there any other questions? Thank you. So that concludes just the high level overview of where we're at in the budget uh, projection process, what assumptions we're utilizing and uh, the reductions we're proposing at this point in time. Have you done uh, analysis, uh, financial analysis of the um more conservative assumptions on the extension of, of the shelter in place to the two dates that you, you mentioned earlier in the presentation? Yes, so I have done a really rough analysis uh, utilizing the uh, 831 September 1st for general fund and also for the December 31st, January 1st effect on the general fund and what that looks like uh, as far as revenue or yeah revenue reductions across the board, uh, just for that particular fund, I have not looked citywide to see what that impact may be. Are you ready to share that with us, or do you need to do more analysis before you present that to us? I would like to refine a little bit before presenting that to council, uh, just to make sure my assumptions align. Uh, most of the, well, both two of those assumptions uh, push everything back about 18 months for the 831 assumption analysis. And then for the January 31st analysis, I think it goes a little bit further into a 21 month time period. Um, so I would like to refine that a little bit before presenting that to council and also include other funds citywide. Uh, to show what that impact may be. All right, thank you. You're welcome. I have a question, Andrea, about the 831 date. Is there a reason sure. why 831 was chosen as opposed to the end of quarter one, uh, September 31st? Um, I just, 
yeah, just as far as hearing timeframes, uh, some of the, the assumptions of children going back to school, school starting up, I would just an assumption thinking that maybe the, the governor has to make a decision uh, with a huge population going back to school, uh, but it could, I mean, that could very well be September 30th, October 1st, uh, just thinking that it seemed like that's when some of the restrictions may be lifted because we're getting at a point where kids would normally go, be going back to school at that point in time. Okay, um, I, I, I guess I just wanna say, I mean, first of all, I, I agree that we it would be incredibly helpful to have some deeper analysis uh, for these different dates. Um, I, I think it is really helpful to have that range. Uh, to look at the different possibilities. And I also do recognize that a lot has changed <laughs> since we first started having these conversations. And so definitely understand that you need more time. Um, you know, typically we would do these exit study sessions this time of year and we're dreaming up all the great things we're gonna do with the, the money that we have um, to expand services in the community. And obviously we're having a different conversation. I'm glad that we're starting the conversation now. Because um, obviously, I think this this is very likely to look bleaker as we move forward. Um, but I think it, I don't know, for me, keeping with the quarters would be helpful. Um, it's not something I'm, I'm married to, but I think in terms of the dates of using clear cut, like end of quarter dates uh, for the contingency planning, I think might be helpful. I understand the rationale makes a lot of sense, the rationale of kind of trying to you know, sync it up closer to when school starts. But I think if we're, you know, from looking at things from quarters, um, that way we can kind of more evenly look at the different contingencies and really get a sense that we're talking about three month increments. Um, so that would just be a suggestion. I don't know what my, you know, if anyone else feels strongly about that, it's okay if you don't, but I felt like that might be helpful in really having a more equal picture of looking quarter to quarter, um, the different impacts. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate that comment. Uh, I wasn't even looking at 831 not being the end of the quarter. So yeah, it probably makes sense for us to go by quarter since uh, Humboldt State is already gonna start at 815 or eight, certainly before 831. And I'm not sure when exactly the high school and elementary schools go back, but they usually go back late August. So um, I don't know that the 831 is actually gonna be useful compared to the end of the quarter, 931. Do we have information on additional expenses that the city has incurred from the COVID-19 crisis and projections on what we expect additional expenses will will be during the course of this budget. Uh, yeah, we do. So this is Karen, and we have done both um, just sort of our out of pocket expenses and had submitted those uh, both to the league and to Cal OES and FEMA, hopefully for reimbursement. And then just this week. Uh, sent those to Assembly Member Wood and Senator McGuire's office uh, as they have agreed to try to see what potential federal stimulus monies that came to the state to help with the state and with cities that are under 500 in population to help cap those. So if, uh, let me just pull those numbers up. So we did two estimates, uh, if I can quickly. We did two estimates. One was cost to date through April 30th. And then the second estimate uh, was just through the month of May are the two that they asked for. So in terms of actual um, out-of-pocket expenses through April 30th, we've submitted a time a cost of 463,200. Now, um, 126,000 of that is staff time that is typically covered in your budget, but I just felt like was way above and beyond what we would typically be uh, spending as far as just direct our response to COVID-19. Uh, and then 262,000 of that was the staff mandatory emergency leave bank. So as the council will probably recall, the federal uh, 
the original federal law that was passed around COVID-19 required agencies to provide these emergency leave banks. Private industries in that legislation were granted the ability to, in essence, get a refund for that cost uh, through reduced Social Security taxes that would be due from those businesses back to the federal government. Local governments were left out of that provision, so that is a cost that at this point the cities are still left with. Um, we're still fighting for that, and if there is a fourth piece of legislation, I'm not hearing good news um, out of Washington around that, but we do still have requests in to have that covered. So, you know, 390,000 of that 463 are those expenses. Uh, and then the remainder, so we're, uh, you know, in gloves, masks, face shields, disinfection, facility protective measures, uh, in addition to like the porta potties and the hand washing stations, all of that, those expenses we do expect to get some reimbursement for, uh, as has been what we've been told from OES and uh, and FEMA. So we're hopeful on you know about a hundred thousand of that that we would get reimbursed for. They asked for projections through May 30th, which we have asked for an additional 248 thousand. Again, a good chunk of that, about 118 thousand is associated with that mandatory emergency leave bank uh, for employees that are home with kids uh, or are on leave during this COVID period. So uh, we asked for an additional 248,000. So we'll continue to track our ability uh, to get reimbursement through any of those programs for those expenses that we've had. Are we projecting uh, reimbursements within the uh, this new budget or, or not? Yeah, we're not we're not projecting any reimbursements, uh, and we are projecting that basically, as we talked about on the revenue side, that 100% of those businesses that are eligible for sales tax deferrals uh, take advantage of those sales tax deferrals. So it's another real important data piece for, for us that we should have within the next couple of weeks a sense of a list of what uh, businesses in Arcata have applied for that relief, and if there are some that are actually starting to pay in to their sales tax, uh, to the you know their sales tax obligations at this point as well. So all of that we do still want to build into your budget, but we did want to give you a sense of where we were at this point, um, recognizing that there are some additional cuts to be made. So for later sessions, we'll be going through uh, department by department as we usually do. Yeah, that's, you know, at the will of the council tonight, um, I could suggest that we could go through certainly our enterprise funded accounts, um, maybe starting with water and wastewater, if you wanted to go through some of that um, more detailed discussion. Uh, or we could go through, you know, community development has several activities that have less of a general fund uh, in them as well, or if you want to hold and just go through uh, the, the budget detail that was provided to you today and hold for another meeting, uh, we certainly could do that as well. well what, is, what is the will of the council on this? Well, I'm just wondering what, uh, you know, it seems like there is some, some agreement that we don't have a complete picture here and it's very uncertain uh, what the revenues will be. So I guess I'm wondering what that looks like right now going through the departments we're just going to talk about what may or may not get cut or because i don't understand what we're really talking about because none of the numbers seem solid to me sure well i think the revenues that you're speaking of are predominantly within the general fund so uh, i think we've got i mean i do actually think that all of our projections are realistic for what we will see in your next fiscal year budget um, so i guess okay so you said realistic mm -hmm. so uh, why why are they realistic, I guess, is my question. Um, they're realistic because, you know, we've had some level of analysis of, you know, how many businesses are eligible for deferral programs, uh, how many businesses, you know, what our year over year uh, sales tax, TUT tax and bed tax is. Uh, certainly the lifting of the shelter in place is ultimately what's going to determine if our estimates are, are accurate. But if we really do have a substantial reopening 
uh, by July 1st, then I think that the, the estimates that have been created are accurate looking at historical data around sales tax, TUT, and bed tax. Uh, if the shelter in place order stays in for a significant longer period of time, then absolutely deeper cuts would have to be made. Uh, but it seems like we're just at this point where uh, planning for a much longer shelter in place it's a hard, I mean, you know, we could we could plan for another, you know, three to six months, certainly, but it does seem like there is conversation of things starting to reopen as soon as, you know, the end of this week on some of that. Uh, we've got some significant planning uh, this next week going into what does Humboldt State University look like? That's a huge contingency for us. If they are uh, able to have in-classroom education versus all telecommuting next year, that's a significant uh, addition or, you know, or reduction in our budget. So there are some real specific pieces of data that will go into this, but assuming uh, that Humboldt, you know, reopens with classes uh, in place in August and assuming that at least, you know, a majority of the shelter in place is lifted with the exception, remember we had a 50% reduction in TOT that's been baked into this budget between that first quarter, so July, August, September, so really assuming that we don't get back to travel as normal uh, until, you know, October, November here in Humboldt, um, you know, that I think it's, it's a really decent starting point for, for our budget projections. Um, yeah, so I'll agree with this. I'll definitely agree with the starting point. Um, and I guess I feel like, yeah, I mean, you, you know, HSU being the, probably the biggest economic factor uh, and not having any of that information included in this. Um, yeah, I guess that's, uh, I need to, I need to, yeah, get myself to understand that better, I guess. Um, I'll, I'll chime in here. Uh, I, I think uh, it would be helpful for us to plan for another study session where we have some more information of kind of these different contingency dates, looking at the different quarters and what it would look like as things, if things are getting pushed out further and further with our shelter in place orders and also recognizing too, you know, even if we are starting to reopen up certain, you know, what have been considered non-essential businesses, um, the nature of how they operate obviously is gonna be very different. Like you mentioned, Karen, you know, it may be, you know, curbside, you know, pick up only. And so the volume that our businesses are going to see are not necessarily going to be the same as pre-COVID. Also, while people are still, uh, you know, wanting to make sure that we're slowing the spread of disease. So I think having another study session where we can have some more information, uh, looking at these different dates um, and of contingencies would be really helpful. Um, I think then to look at that, that picture of how this affects the different departments would be really good. Um, and then I think also it would be really realistic for us to expect that we are having some sort of budget study session once a month, like into the new fiscal year um, on some level or having it on our agenda regularly so that we are always um, having a, a pulse of what's going on. And if we do need to rapidly uh, adapt to something um, that that's not surprising to us that we're, we're having that mindset that we're not passing a budget, you know, to start July 1st, and then we do a mid-year budget review. I think it's clear that given the fluidity of the situation that every month situation could be looking very different. And as we get more information about what does our economy look like as, as, as it evolves. So that's kind of where I'm at in terms of what would be helpful to help guide this budget process um, is having some time for you all to work on that analysis given the guidance that we've given um, and that we should really anticipate that this is not going to just be a one and done we pass a, a budget for, <laughs> for this next fiscal year it's going to be a really you know it's going to be a back and forth conversation um, so i think the starting point that you're presenting to us today i think is very uh, reasonable um given the very limited information that we have um the modeling that we have for COVID-19 is not as substantive as you know I, I mean council member watson i appreciate your example about sea level rise and the importance of us having this range 
Uh, Cause I totally agree. We do need that range to be looking at the bigger picture. And yet the modeling that we have for something like this um, is nowhere near the information we have for sea level rise, for example. So I think for this as a starting point, it's reasonable. And uh, I think, I guess that my question to staff would be, you know, when do you think is a reasonable timeline for us to be looking at numbers for these different dates um, for, for our budgeting? So I guess what I would offer is actually, you know, um, Andrea and I have done quite a bit of that in terms of a direct numbers, like what does it look like if um, shelter in place is, you know, in place until the end of the second quarter, until the end of the third quarter, until the end of the fourth quarter. Um, those are numbers that I think we could come up with fairly quickly. It's coming up with that set of assumptions, I think, that the council is comfortable with to then be able to build the final budget around, you know, recognizing that we're probably not going to have even all the data that any of us would like at the time that we do that. So I think we should focus on building that range of assumptions and finding the comfort zone on the council on, on that list of assumptions at this point. Uh, and then we've done a substantial portion of building out the expenditures associated with a level of assumptions. And then we can build that around a new level of assumptions if they change. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah, I, I, I like that for sure. I just, uh, one of the things that I noticed is the uh, TOT talking about it being like a 50% reduction. And I think that it's probably more like a, 90 percent so um you know the that's governor, exactly the kind of thing i'm talking about paul yeah 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 the governor's uh um shelter in place order basically eliminates tot uh for the most part so um i think 50 percent is is too uh it, it's too small it should be much higher than that Well, and we also don't know, even if certain activities are allowed, whether people will actually uh, participate in them in terms of uh, if eat in restaurants are allowed, if, if uh, hotels and, and Airbnbs are allowed, how many people will actually avail themselves of these. And I agree with Council Member Pereira that having this regularly on the city council agenda, probably at least every other regular city council meeting, and so that we can look at both um, uh, directives from the governor, directives from the county health department, and so that we can uh, do quick reassessments that I think are necessary in this very fluid situation. So I think that council members Pereira's suggestion is is really a good one for us to to follow. Yeah, I just want to add I uh, appreciate council members Pereira's comments, and I agree with everything she said. All right, so moving forward, um, do we want to pause tonight and just work, you know, back work based on those assumptions? And then in terms of monthly updates, again, I think it would be based on that ultimate line of assumptions and we would then be able to let you know how are we measuring up to each of those assumption lines, you know, as we move forward at, at the end of each month or something. Um, but that sounds like the next course of direction. Yeah, that, that sounds good. I, I think that as we look at the uh, uh, decrease in our general fund and the monthly look at that is a good uh, factor for me to say, how are we doing? Have we been able to reduce that loss? So did we figure something out we could do? Um, or is it getting better or worse? So yeah, monthly. Thank you. Are there any other specific data points that that you've been thinking about or that you have any interest in that weren't at least touched on in some overview tonight? I just want to echo um, my, the support for having a more aggressive um, assumption of declined uh, TOT. So whether that's 90% or 80%, I mean, but, but yeah, I, I do agree. I mean, e even if it is, if we do see more of a return of TOT, um, 
you know, then a 50% reduction, then great. But I think in terms of just planning for that, because our hope is, is that people aren't traveling here right now. <laughs> Realistically, that, that would be our hope. And so I think including that in, in, in the budget assumptions, I think would, would be prudent. So I appreciate that point being, being raised. Is there anything else that you want to uh, present tonight, um, Karen or other staff members? Uh, I think if we want to focus on assumptions, that that's probably a good route to go. And until, you know, once we get to an agreed range anyway of assumptions, uh, that it would be more practical use of your time to look at a budget built around that. So. So have any public comments come in during the meeting? Double check. Yeah. We have not received any public comment. So any uh, any final words from staff or members of the council? Well, I'll just throw out a date that maybe in, as opposed to holding until your next council meeting that maybe two weeks from tonight, we do another check-in on budget and on the building of assumptions. So maybe on the 18th or sometime close, you've got a council meeting on the 20th. Mm -hmm. With that, so maybe when we do our final around, you could comment on whether or not that date would maybe work or, or we could doodle pull a few dates around that time frame too. I like the 18th, that'll work for me. Uh, yes, that, that works for me too. And just as a final comment, I just really wanna express my gratitude to uh, Andrea, Karen and our directors and, and all the staff. I mean, I just think for, you know, the last time that we had a severe budget deficit, it, um, you know, a lot of really tough decisions had to be made, um, but we got through it. And so I'm, I know that we'll get through this somehow and, but I know it's going to be really painful. Um, so I, I don't envy the, the work that you have to really pour through these numbers. Um, and then we as policy, you know, we give that policy guidance. I know we have really tough decisions ahead of us as well. Um, so I just want to say thank you because this is no easy task. And I think the uncertainties are even greater than they were 12 years ago. And that makes it even more difficult and, and more challenging. And so I also appreciate uh, what uh, staff is doing and city managers is doing under these difficult circumstances, which are also physically different, difficult for everyone. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so I think that uh, if there are no other final words, then we are adjourned.